The crimes, the criminals, why did they do it? Who got hurt? Did they meet justice or commit the perfect crime? You'll find all the clues at Jim Harold's Crime Scene. Welcome to the Crime Scene. I am Jim Harold. So glad to be with you once again. And when we talk about true crime, uh, some of the most heartbreaking stories are those that involve teenagers. And uh, today we're going to talk about a backyard brawl turned media circus filled with gang accusations that turned a small, quiet town upside down in uh, what is the second book in the Simon True series. Our guest today is Eve Perinchak. She is the author of the book. And since earning a degree in biology and psychology from UCLA, Eve has lived all over the planet, including third world countries, and spent much of her time in and out of prison as a creative writing teacher and advocate for teen inmates. She serves as an aid worker in Tijuana orphanages and quenches her thirst for all things literary as an agent with the Jill Corcoran Literary Agency in Los Angeles. A former medical student, child welfare worker, and first grade teacher, Eve grew up on a steady diet of unsolved mysteries and in search of, which I'm already a fan. (laughs) And we're so glad to have her with us. Uh, Eve, welcome to the program. Now, this book, One Cut, is the uh, is the second in the Simon True series. If we're not familiar, tell us about that series. Well, it's actually, uh, we're launching two books at one time. Um, we're starting kind of a new genre with Simon & Schuster. I teamed up with them about a year and a half ago, and I pitched the idea to um, write books about teens who have been involved in uh, the system after committing crimes. But I also rather than wanting it to be sensationalized, I really wanted it to have more of a juvenile justice bent. Um, So in working with incarcerated teens for, gosh, 10 years now or so, uh, you know, I had a (laughs) plethora of stories, sadly, to draw from. But um, there's this one that's been bothering me since I read about it back in 1995. And so I pitched the idea to Simon & Schuster, and they said, we love it, it's great, let's do a whole series of books about uh, children who have committed crimes rather teens who've committed crimes. So we sort of went on a search to find people who could write these books. Um, I was pitching it as a literary agent at the time, um, but I just happened to be a writer as well. So they gave me a shot. I wrote the first book. Um, We were going to launch uh, Catherine Nichols' Deep Water um, at some point as well, which is about the Coronado Company. If you haven't uh, read about it, it's a fantastic story about teens who started a drug smuggling ring in the 70s um, by swimming drugs from Mexico to San Diego. But anyway, we decided because we both uh, hit our deadlines so early, we decided to launch both books at the same time. So they're both coming out on May 2nd. And then after that, um, I have another couple of clients who are writing books that will come out in the spring and fall of 2018. So that will be the new Simon True line. It's juvenile justice or rather true crime for and about teens. Now, let me ask you this. Why does the subject of uh, teens who find themselves in a criminal situation and many people would say, hey, you know, they've chosen this, even if they're teenagers, they should know better. Uh, and some people would say, no, it's the circumstances that they're put into. I guess I would ask you two things. How did you get involved or interested in this whole area in general? And then what side of the fence do you fall on? Is it like, oh, you know, a kid 16, 17 years old, they should know better. Or, or do you fall into the camp? You know, many times this is due to circumstances beyond these kids control. Yeah, I think the first thing is that um, I've never been involved in the criminal justice system as 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 a an inmate myself. <laughs> I had a, a rather boring life growing up, but in college, uh, I was running the UCLA Unicamp, which is a philanthropy camp, and noticed that a lot of our juveniles who would come to the camp um, from the inner city had been involved in the juvenile justice system. So I, I got really involved with um, the Los Angeles Juvenile uh prison and camp system. So it's where children have um, lost their trials and then they will be doing time in the uh, the prison camps. So I tutored in the prison camps, um, gosh, a long time ago in college and really just loved working with that population. So I've always worked with um, incarcerated youth in, in some form or another. Uh, now I teach creative writing with Inside Out Writers, which is a program that um, was started by Mark Salzman and Karen Hunt back, oh gosh, 20 some years ago. So in teaching creative writing to the juveniles in the LA County juvenile jails, I noticed that for the most part, uh, the youth in there, you know, they, 
for the most part, they're, they're gang related crimes for the most part. But there certainly are plenty of teens in there who were at the wrong place at the wrong time or made a poor choice, you know, split decision that changed their lives. And, and often they're tried as adults and end up doing adult time and life. So uh, my sister, Amy Thornhill, is a uh, public defender and she specializes in representing children who are tried as adults. And I would say the bulk of her cases are involve teens who made very poor choices or were forced to do something. But she's very involved in researching um, the the brain science about youth and whether they really can process things like adults. So there's a lot going on now, I think, in the juvenile justice system in terms of realizing that teens are not adults. Their brains are just not fully developed. And therefore, should they be treated and tried as adults? And I, I believe no. I really don't think they should. I don't think that should even exists. Sadly, it does in, in most states. Um, so children as young as 12 now in some states can be tried as adults and do life in prison. So let's talk about this case. Uh, one cut, the story of uh, Jimmy Ferris and Mike McLaurin and the fight that cost six lives. What brought your attention to this case? Um, interestingly, I, I read about the case in 1997. There was a, a wonderful article in Rolling Stone written by Randall Sullivan. and it was called uh, Lynching in Malibu. Fantastic article, and it shocked me because it involved teens who grew up in a town very much like my own. I grew up, in, uh, for the most part, in Anaheim Hills, very rural. Everyone rode horses at the time. So Agora Hills, California, especially 1995, was rural, safe. Everyone knew everyone. It was the number one town for law enforcement in L.A. County to live in. It was just could not be safer. And so, you know, a lot of people were moving out of Los Angeles proper into the, the suburbs like that be, to get away from gang crime and drugs and, and the bad influences for their teens. So the irony was that these boys were basically just looking to smoke some pot after a day of drinking when they should have been in school and um, got into a fist fight and four of them ended up in prison for life because someone accidentally died. Um, the interesting thing was I had followed the case since it happened and it shocked me because again, these are four nice, normal kids from wonderful families in a nice, normal town. I mean, it really struck me because it could happen to anybody. And uh, ironically, when I started working for Inside Out Writers uh, almost 10 years ago, I met a woman named Sherry Holland. Sherry was, or is, I'm sorry, the mother of two of the boys who are now in prison for life. And so we taught together for years and she is just lovely. So I got to know her very well. Um, she is the mother of Jason Holland and Micah Holland. And I told her if I ever had an opportunity to write a book about this story, I would do that. So that's where I am today. So tell us uh, what happened that changed all of these lives and ended ended uh, lives in many ways. Um, tell us, tell us what happened. You know, I think that Jimmy Ferris, Mike McLaurin, Jason Holland, Micah Holland, Brandon Hine, and Tony Miliotti, all the boys involved were nice, normal teens who went to school, um, they worked hard, they had friends, they were involved in athletics, but they also liked to party, you know? And I, I think that like many teens, uh, they liked to drink and smoke pot and occasionally they would skip school and do that. And Mike McLaurin had a backyard clubhouse that he and Jimmy had built and it was like, they called it the fort. And kids would go after school and drink a few beers and then go home or go to football practice or whatever, wherever it was that they were going. But it was a, a, a hangout for kids. And the four boys, Micah, Jason, Brandon, and Tony, went after school one day. Uh, they had been drinking, and they went to get a little bit of pot because Mike McLaurin was known to sell small amounts of pot out of the fort. Sometimes they would just stay and smoke it, but other times they would buy it and then go to um, Gates Canyon Park. And they went over there to get some, and he and Micah, Mike McLaurin and Micah had some words. They had been in a fight from something that had happened before, about a week before. They were upset with each other. They got in a fist fight. Micah got beaten pretty bad. Um, a small pocket knife was pulled out um, during the fight. Jimmy was stabbed and he died within a couple of minutes. Wow. So that's basically what happened. And in my opinion, nothing was intentional. Um, I do think 
it was just a split decision, poor choice. Uh, Mike McLaurin and Jimmy were much bigger and stronger than the other boys. And Micah was only 15 years old at the time. Mike McLaurin, who was beating him up, was 18. He was 30 pounds heavier and several inches taller. So it was, you know, it was just a very unfortunate circumstance. The fight lasted less than 20 seconds. The estimate is between 10 and 20 seconds. And um, unfortunately, Jimmy perished because the the blade uh, nicked the pericardial sac and he bled out within two minutes. Oh, my. Yeah. So it's really extremely unfortunate. The um, physician who was at the emergency room when Jimmy was brought in had said, had the knife landed literally a couple of millimeters to the right or left, he would be alive today. Wow. Wow. And that's the thing. I think what does happen with some teenagers um, is that you said it's split second decisions and not good ones. And for some reason, they don't seem to be able to kind of calculate out all of the possible permutations of the bad things that can happen. I think of stories of like, you'll hear of a couple of kids getting a car after drinking or whatever, and right. they'll, they'll end up running into a tree or something. And you just think, Oh my gosh, so much promise, uh, such a long lifespan ostensibly ahead of them. And, and then they just make this one really dumb decision and uh, either ruin or end in their lives or those of somebody else's. And I think that extends to this kind of thing. It sounds like it's a situation that escalated quickly. You probably have a lot of testosterone going yes. there and a little bravado. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm going to show you. And all of a sudden you end up with uh, uh, dead people and, and people whose lives are basically over because of the things that have happened and some of the decisions they've made. Is that mapped to, to, to what you see? Oh, exactly. And I think that, like I said, this situation, this story could have happened to absolutely anyone, myself included. I, you know, I, and, and even not just teens, but adults certainly make stupid decisions as well, um, you know, in the heat of the moment. And so it really was, I believe, truly an accident. And it's, it's unbelievable that somebody died and it is so unfortunate. But then the aftermath was was horrible as well in terms of four boys going away to prison for life when they were 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, and again, I, I keep emphasizing it could happen to anybody because these were nice kids who were friends. They were friends. This wasn't like it was two groups who hated each other. Um, Micah and Mike McLaurin had been at a sleepover a week before, and some other guys were clowning on McLaurin, and Micah started making fun of him with the other boys, and he was mad at him. So it was really a, a kind of a a normal teen thing to be mad at your friend for, for being a jerk. Um, and fist fights are, you know, not uncommon, of course. <laughs> and the California felony murder rule, what is this rule and how did it impact them? So the California felony murder rule, uh, which is a rule that uh, exists in a lot of states, um, legal scholars believe it started around the, uh, around the 1400s in England, when it was a time when, uh, you know, oftentimes there'd be crimes that involved a lot of people. You couldn't tell who killed who. Forensics were not very sophisticated. So uh, they developed the felony murder rule to say, basically, if you are planning to commit a crime that is a felony, felony includes um, burglary, carjacking, rape, um, killing of a police officer, that kind of thing. So big, big, scary crimes. If you intend to commit one of those felonies and somebody accidentally dies in the process, no matter who it is or what the intent was, everyone involved, even peripherally, can be put away for life and charged and tried for murder, first degree murder. So it's it's a really big scary law that many people don't know about. It's something that whenever I tell people, they don't believe me. They say, there's no way. So basically, a, it, it, in, you know, a really bizarre example would be, Jim, if you and I are going to 7-Eleven right. and right. we're just going to get um, some licorice and maybe a Coke and I'm out in the car or I'm, you know, talking to some friends outside and you go in and you decide to rob the place. 
you know, you have you happen to have something with you. So you might have, let's say, a stick. You beat the cashier with a stick while you're trying to steal some licorice and some coke. Mm-hmm. He falls, hits his head on the ground, accidentally dies. You and I can both be charged with felony murder, and we can go away for life because somebody accidentally died. Now, if there are friends of ours who are in the parking lot with us, Mm -hmm. or rather with me, and we had no idea of what your intention was, we can all still go away for life for felony murder. That's frightening. That's frightening. It really is. I mean, mean, and, and maybe I'm a little harsh, but if somebody hits someone and they die, they fall because they were hit and whatever, I mean, you know, that's one thing. But being in the parking lot, not knowing what your friends are up to, to me, that's an entirely different thing. Yeah, it's frightening. And it, and I will say that, um, and I, I've learned over the years, because my sister, like I said, has been a public defender for 20 years and represents teens tried as adults. She has so many cases that are exactly what I just described, um, where children can go to prison for life because somebody accidentally died. And it's, it, it's guilt by association, and it was intended to punish people like bank robbers or, you know, um, gang members who are involved in a major crime where there is a drive-by shooting, that kind of thing. So it was really intended for criminals who worked as a pack, as a group, who intended to commit a felony, and they had what they call uh, reckless indifference for human life. So that rule can be applied anytime someone dies during the course of a felony. The interesting thing about this case, the most interesting thing to me, is that a felony was never even committed, nor was it ever intended. But that was the whole twist that um, the two prosecutors involved in the case, it was a very politically charged case, and they had to get a conviction. And Jimmy Ferris is the son of a very beloved police officer. And um, so it was pretty political, and they wanted a conviction. And so they sort of made up this idea that a felony was intended. Um, so it's, it's really depressing that this does happen quite a bit. And I, I wish more people knew about it because there are people in prison for life who really truly have done nothing wrong ever. And I'm assuming, uh, I, I mean, what is the status? Uh, what is the status now? Do they, they have, uh, I believe uh, at least one of the sentences were commuted. I mean, what is the, what is the, the, the just in the sense that uh, are they doomed to life at this point, or what's the what's the status right now? You know, that's interesting as well. We've been working on that quite a bit, and it's it's complicated. You know, life without parole, which is what these boys were given, is really difficult to change. Once you are tagged with a life without parole sentence, it's like only an act of God can get you out of that. Um, so they did appeal, um, and actually... Uh, So first, Michael Holland was 15 at the time. Judge Myra uh, changed his sentence to life with the possibility of parole. So he still had a chance for parole, which was great because of his age. Um, On appeal, Tony Milioti, who stood in the doorway, by the way, never touched anybody during the fight. uh, His sentence was changed on appeal to life with the possibility of parole. So both Tony and Micah over the years have been told, you know, you may have a possibility of parole someday. Um, The laws have changed since this happened 22 years ago. We have SB 260 and SB 261, uh, which it basically involved um, kids who were 18 or under basically who they have to be reevaluated after a certain number of years so that so that basically so teens aren't languishing in prison indefinitely um, and can never be reevaluated. So it's very complicated. But anyway, so Tony and Micah do have a possibility of parole. Tony came up for parole in 2011 and he was denied. The reason he was denied parole is because he did not have anywhere to go. His his family had all perished. Oh, um, he, yeah, he. He was raised by an aunt and uncle and a lot of cousins, and he, and it, he had, a, you know, it's very unfortunate. So most of his family members had perished. He had nowhere to live. He had no job. So in order to be paroled in California, I don't think people realize how difficult it is <laughs> to actually get parole. 
you have to have dozens and dozens of letters of support. You have to have an established job, a source of income, a house, and you have to prove to the parole board that you will not, there's no way you can commit any crimes for the rest of your life. So it's a very, very, very difficult thing to to be granted. And Tony, anyway, Tony was denied parole, not because he's been a difficult prisoner, not because he's done anything wrong in prison, but only because he has no family. And he, and it's really difficult to get a job and a house on the outs when most of us, you know, who haven't been in prison have a hard enough time doing that. So it's a really difficult process. So in 2009, Governor Schwarzenegger um, was badgered by a group of friends of mine who are lovely people who work in the, the system with these kind of kids. And they got him to commute Brandon Hines' sentence. What they did was he still has life, but they took out the without the possibility of parole, which means Brandon, in theory, will be up for parole someday. So that's good news. The bad news is that Last September, he had a parole date that came up on September 21st. We were prepared. His family, Gene Hine, his father had gotten him a job, a home. He had hundreds of people supporting him. He absolutely has been a model prisoner. He has skills. He's very bright. Um, his parole date came up, and that morning his attorney received a call, and the parole board decided to cancel it with no explanation. Wow. I didn't even know they could do that. Yeah, they can. <laughs> they, so it was one of the most depressing things I've ever heard in my life because he had all these people surrounding him. We'd all been visiting him in prison, getting him prepared. Um, he, he had you know all his statements written. Again, he had a home. He had a job. He had a couple job offers. So we really had a lot of wraparound services. And they just, the morning of, they literally woke him up and said, we changed our mind. Politically we motivated? Might, you know, I don't know. I've been trying to find out, and no one seems to have any answers. So the the official word the parole board gave us was that, oh, it was a glitch in the system. We put the wrong date in there, which simply isn't true. But, yeah, they can do that. So well, now wouldn't he's they, got wouldn't they, uh, uh, In other words, they're saying it, it should have been years hence. It should be years in advance. It's not like a week or two or a month or two off. Exactly. Wow, they said, wow. we'll reevaluate in three to five years. So, you know, I can speculate what happened, but I really don't know. I mean, these strange things in the in the prison system happen all the time. And, and gen the saddest part is that generally most of the prisoners I know don't have the support of family and friends on the outside who mm. have the means, have the education. No advocates, no advocates. Right. So um, you've got all these people who have no shot. Now, the thing is, is that now here's what some people will say, and I want to get your reflection on this. You know, um, this sounds like a, an extreme case, and yeah. uh, it, it sounds like uh, some unfortunate things have happened here. But if you go, quote, gutting the laws, then, you know, teenagers are going to feel that they can go on these killing sprees. Now, you might say, I bet those kids weren't even aware of the laws that were in place, <laughs> so they weren't any deterrent. What are what are your thoughts, though? I mean, to someone that said, hey, you, you know, law and order, we can't we can't go gutting the, the teeth out of the laws. What would you say to them? You know, I get it. I honestly I get both sides. I really do. And I and it's interesting. I, I've talked a little bit with um, people from the Ferris family and they are the nicest family in the world. And they, you know, I think that they respect the law. And I get it. They, the law is in place for a good reason. And quite honestly, if it was my child who was stabbed and killed, I would probably feel exactly the same way. And I would probably say, you know what? You four guys were up to no good. You need to be punished. I, I, I totally see that side. And I also think, you know, I, I work with a lot of members of various gangs in, in prison. And, I, and, you know, a lot of them act recklessly in a group and or they're on a mission where they don't have a choice or, or they're rather they're given a choice to participate or not kind of thing. But when you're in a, it's very complicated when you're in a gang, you kind of got to put in work. And so you may be the, the getaway car or the lookout. Um, so, you know, if I had a close friend or family member who was killed um, in a shootout, 
during a, a gang robbery, would I want everyone involved to go away to prison for life? I might. I very well might. I don't know. You know, it's it's so complicated. And I think in, until these things affect you personally, it's really hard to see all the sides. Um, so I get it. I get the law. I get why it exists. I do think it makes sense in some cases. I think that the prosecutor's decision to use it in this case was absolutely inappropriate. And um, there were two prosecutors. There was uh, Michael Latin, who I've spoken to, who's a lovely man, uh, and Jeffrey Simo, who has now perished. He died a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, you know, Mike Latin, looking back 22 years ago, he's like, yeah, you know, we needed a conviction. And he was young and he was establishing his career. And even he now says this was never <laughs> a first degree murder case, this should have been a manslaughter case. Mm -hmm. And I said, exactly, exactly. So is there any way we can right that wrong now? So I, I'm really hoping that he'll, you know, come forward and write a letter or speak to the governor, you know, just because I think that can make a big difference. You know, I think that, that their choice to use the felony murder rule was awful and never should have happened. Um, what is your hope for this book? I mean, it's out by a major major publisher you can't get much bigger than simon and schuster uh, <laughs> you can't get bigger than simon and schuster so what what do you hope what kind of change do you hope it can affect you know quite honestly it's funny people i think in general in the publishing world people outside of the publishing world believe that writers <laughs> sit home in their robes and write and make a lot of money and the, the reality is that none of us most of us don't make any money on books we get small advances. We use those advances to purchase trial transcripts or uh, travel to prisons to talk to people or whatever it is. And so I don't, I'm not going to say, I, you know, I want this to be a bestseller and I want to be at JK Rowling level because I, I don't think um, that's what I've ever aspired to. But what I really want to be quite honest with you, I would love it if these books, both One Cut and Deep Water, I would love it if high school English teachers or high school, um, you know, social science teachers are, w would bring these to their classrooms because I think that there's so much to learn from these stories. And again, this could happen to anybody. Um, these kids are relatable. They're funny. They're interesting. They're talented. I mean, it's, these are not, you know, bad seeds who meant to hurt people at all. And so I would love it if this could be picked up in the school and library market. That's always been my, my dream. Um, I was a teacher for a long time. I still teach. Um, and I really think that teachers, parents, and teens, you know, who are interested in this kind of thing would, would benefit from reading it. It's really, it's not a, a salacious, sensational entertainment type story but to me it's fascinating and very educational in terms of the laws um, I know this case is taught in some law schools in California which is fantastic I know that it's been taught at USC I would love it if this book made it into some college courses um, and was required reading well I gotta tell you it is fascinating and when I first looked at it, I'm like, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure if this is a fit. And then I looked into it more and I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is a fit. Because I think we always come from, particularly when we're talking about true crime, we tend to look at it as the murderer, that evil murderer who did this. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, many times I believe that's true. I do believe in good and evil. But then you see these in-between cases where certainly – there is punishment that that needed to be doled out, but maybe maybe that punishment has gone uh, gone for and uh, too far, and the, the the pendulum has swung swung too far in in the other direction. And I'm so glad that we had uh, this opportunity to talk about it. Now I'm assuming people can find one cut wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I know that I know that you could pre-order it. Um, I guess on the on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and all all the the sites. But yeah, it will it will be carried pretty much everywhere. I, you know, I'm hoping a lot of indie bookstores pick it up. Um, the other thing I want to mention, the second part to your, your question you just asked prior, and I hope this is okay. No, please do. I, I really, my, one of my goals uh, every day is to educate people on, on what 
prisoners actually go through in prison. They're not sitting around <laughs> watching TV, smoking, working out. These guys are, most prisoners that I know in California are on lockdown 23 hours a day. There are more prisoners in, in the SHU, what they call a secure housing unit, which used to be called the box or the whole solitary confinement. They're in there 23 hours a day for years. And Micah and Jason were in there for 12 years without ever touching a human. And it's, it's, it's cruel and unusual. And it's, it's, it's an enormous problem and a lot of people don't know about it. So I really want to humanize prisoners. And these guys in particular, they are good people, lovely people. They've stayed out of trouble. They have really done a lot of wonderful things, you know, in a terrible place in terms of, getting their educations. They create artwork. Um, Brandon Hine has a website. You can go to brandonhineart.com. His art is outstanding. I, I collect it constantly because he's so talented and it's not easy to get supplies at prison. So I guess my main thing is I, I just want people to think about when they talk about locking people up and throwing away the key, I, I just want people to know that the, these are humans and some of my best, best friends in the world were incarcerated. and I tell you what, <laughs> there's nothing like take, getting your freedom taken away to make you really appreciate life. And good, solid, honest people go to prison. You know, it happens. And a lot of times it's, it's not their fault. It's unnecessary and inappropriate. So, you know, I too hope that people can just think twice when they think all criminals are bad. It's, it's just, it's not a black and white issue at all. And this, this could have been me. This absolutely could have been me. And I think that every time I visit them in prison, I think, oh my gosh, I could be sitting right where they're sitting. Cause I, I witnessed plenty of fist fights in my day as a kid. We all did. Food for thought. Our guest has been <laughs> Eve Perinchak. The book is one cut, the fight that costs six lives. Now this will be out as I see here, it looks like it's going to be released May 2nd. And we'll yes. have that out just shortly after that date, even though we're pre-recording it. So everybody should be able to go out and get it as you hear this. Eve, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. This is fantastic. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for tuning in to the crime scene. We do appreciate it. Be careful out there, but also be mindful uh, of those uh, in prison. I think Eve makes an excellent point. We've got to look at this from 360 degrees, not just one way. And Maybe we've made uh, you think. I know it's made me think. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Have a great weekend.